On this meeting is being recorded. On behalf of the International Humans in Space Summit, I would like to welcome you all today to our final panel for this year's summit on a human future in space. We're really excited to have panelists with us from both the US and the UK today, so a truly multinational force. And I would like to hand over to our moderator, Kim Ellis Hayes, to conduct the meeting for us. Thank you very much, Kim. Oh, thank you, Rowena, and welcome everybody who's joined us. I'd like to welcome all of the panelists who've taken time out of their busy schedules to join us and especially for those panellists who've joined us at dark o'clock to be able to do this panel. So I we all really appreciate it and it's really fantastic that you've joined us. So I think what I'll do is I will share my screen real quick and um, let's see if I can... Okay, just share the screen real quick, just so you know you're in the right place, the human future in space. And today, all of our panel members are going to be talking about this human future in space, what it means, what it means to them. We have such a diverse group of panelists here, and everyone is so incredibly engaged and accomplished, reading everybody's bio is absolutely amazing. So I, I, what we're going to do is we're going to start off and each panel member is going to introduce themselves and talk about their area of space. And then we're going to go through and start to answer some of these questions. I mean, we're looking at right now we're doing Earth dependent exploration and human presence in space is expanding but we really haven't gone much further than well we haven't gone further than the moon and there are a bunch of missions which are planned but in order to go further than the moon we really need to have a set of technologies and techniques to allow humans to be able to exist in space to overcome some of those challenges and once we can conduct Earth independent exploration where we have addressed all of these technological challenges, then humans can spend the future living and working in space. So it was great. Thank you, Rowena, for the introduction. I'm just going to speak really briefly about what, what, who I am and where I'm from, and then I'm going to introduce the panellists. So, my name is Kim Ellis Hayes. I work, I'm the CEO of the Hayes Group. Um, I work for Swinburne University of Technology as a Space Technology Program Director. We deliver the first undergraduate multidisciplinary space technology education program in Australia. Um, and I'm training to be the first woman in space first Aussie woman in space. I need to qualify that. There's been lots of women in space, which is great. Um, so I'm really here because I really want to help facilitate this discussion uh, for our community and for these panellists. And so to start off, I'd really like to introduce Miss Adrienne Provenzano, and I'll hand it over to you to do an introduction about what you do and and how you relate to space. All right, well, thank, thank you, Kim, for that introduction. And I will start my uh, introduction of myself with a song. A woman's place <laughs> in outer space, see how far she'll go. Take a trip on a rocket ship with the earth down far below. Take a trip on a zooming ship with the carriage to endure. Cause a woman's place is in outer space. Three, two, one, explore. Going to a space station, walking on the moon. On to Mars just because it's the thing to do. Solar systems, galaxies, universe, that's where she'll be. Cause a woman's place is in outer space. Three, two, one, explore. Woman's place is in outer space. Three, two, one, explore. Da, 
Da -da -da -bum. <laughs> All right, well, that's a <laughs> thank you. And that's a that's a good introduction for me because I'm a musician and I'm an educator and I have a passion for space exploration. And that uh, song was written for an event that was about women and space. And I think space is for everybody and there are many, many more opportunities. And uh, one of the reasons I'm here today is because I'm a volunteer with NASA's Solar System Ambassadors Program. And the SSA is operated through JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Caltech. And this is our 25th year of existence. There are more than a thousand solar system ambassadors across the United States. And we do volunteer outreach in our communities. And that can be in many ways. It can be through music, it can be through visual arts, it can be through all sorts of STEM and theme activities. And I've been involved with SSA since 2014. Now, I'm not an employee, I'm a volunteer with NASA. So I say that and, and mention up front that my opinions at today's panel will be my opinions. They don't represent NASA opinions in any way. One of the great things about being an SSA is we get to participate in all sorts of events with subject matter experts from NASA. So they could be people with the Artemis mission, with Psyche, with Lofted, which just had a really amazing test. <laughs> if anybody was up early in the US this morning, like I was watching the heat shield uh, come back successfully, an expandable heat shield come back successfully to Earth. And that was also the launch of the new joint polar uh, orbiter to study um, the oceans and atmosphere, a project of NOAA, which is a NASA, uh, with the, which is a US agency in collaboration with NASA. So that's the kind of thing that I do. I take my passion for space and my training and experience in education and the arts, uh, specifically music, but other arts as well, and then connect the dots. And another project that I've also been involved in is what's called the International Space Station Suite. And this is a collection of seven pieces that I wrote inspired by the imagery of and from the International Space Station. And I've presented this at a space education conference and I have a educator uh, professional development guide that goes along with it. And the idea is to continue to share these instrumental pieces that help to talk about and <laughs> talk through music about all these amazing things going on on the International Space Station. Um, just to wrap up, I think I'm coming to the end of, of my allotted time. Um, as you all know, the space station has been around up there, uh, fully operational for a number of years now. This is the 22nd year in November of having continual human presence. And as we talk today about the future of human spaceflight, I think this is an amazing time for human spaceflight because right now there's crew 68 expeditions, seven people from around the globe all working together, uh, hundreds of research experiments going on up there. And uh, as Kim mentioned, we're in low Earth orbit now, but hopefully next week there will be a successful uncrewed launch of Artemis One, which will really put NASA further on that path to getting human boots uh, back on the moon and onto Mars in the future. So I will close with a quote that I really like from Carl Sagan the science educator and uh, astrophysicist, he said years ago, the sky calls to us. And I think that's very true. I think the oceans and the sky call to us. And I think there are great opportunities and I look forward to this conversation today. And thanks again for letting me be part of it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adrian. That's really, I, how fantastic to have a song like I never go to any Zoom where there's a song. That was really wonderful. Thank you so much. I think the art really touches everyone involved in space because there's is so much to discover and explore. And so the we need all disciplines to work towards having a human future in space. It's so important to bring everyone with us because of course, once we're living and working in space, it's not just gonna be researchers or engineers, we're gonna need uh, musicians, we're gonna need communicators, we're gonna need um, lawyers and, and all the other disciplines that, aren't, that people don't generally think of when they think of space. So thank you very much, Adrian. That was 
that was wonderful. So now um, we're going to move to, and uh, Dr. Sarah Lynn Mark, who um, is our our next um, speaker, we're going to move towards space medicine, which is something that you know I know a lot of people. Uh, there's so much interest, of course, when you're living and working in space. We need to be able to protect the human body and make sure that the, the harsh environment of space doesn't prevent us from living a healthy life in space. So I think if Sarah Lynn or Sarah, if you would like to um, introduce yourself and talk about your work, that would be really, really fantastic. So this is Sarah Lynn. Great, thank you so much, Kim. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's so wonderful to join you in the future in Australia. I wish I was actually over there right now. So this is just the next best thing. I'm uh, Dr. Sarah Lynn Mark. Uh, please call me Sarah tonight. And I, I just want to continue the art theme for a second. You do not want me to sing. I could maybe dance, but not sing. But I do write. And I actually have a book called Stellar Medicine, A Journey Through the Universe of Women's Health. It's a part memoir guidebook. And I also have a podcast called Always Searching, and we just completed Space Month in the month of October. So check us out on your usual places uh, that you get your podcasts. So that is correct, Kim. I am fascinated by space medicine. And, and let me just very briefly tell you a little bit about my journey. I'm actually a child of the Apollo years, so I'm about a thousand years old. Um, but what I'm excited about <laughs> is that we're going to be creating the Artemis generation. And I know how it's so inspired me to see people walk on the moon. And just imagine, not only are you going to see people, but you may be part of that, especially as we really hopefully democratize space through our commercial space partners. Um, when I was a little girl, I wanted to practice medicine and I wanted to practice on the moon. Fortunately, no one told me that women could not be astronauts at the time. Uh, at the time you had to be a flight, so you had to be flying planes, flying jets, and women were not allowed into that. So I lived with my delusion um, that I could do it. And I actually became an astronaut finalist, got brought into the space program, and it's just been a joy ever since. The painting behind me, by the way, is by Carolyn Cusera. She's an artist in uh, New Mexico and Santa Fe. She actually painted um, Sally Ride's Flight. She was uh, commissioned by NASA. So when I met her, she uh, shared with me this painting. It's called Oceans, and it was taken um, a, a painting from the Hubble telescope. So I'm, I'm happy to have space all around me from you know, Earth to space is where we are tonight. So very quickly, long story, um, I became a physician. I specialized in different areas, including endocrinology and geriatrics. And part of that is as the body adapts in space, it's like accelerated aging, which is extraordinary because your body changes immediately. And so for me, taking these different disciplines has just been incredible because as we learn about space medicine, we're actually able to help our lives here on Earth. Just very briefly, I became the senior medical advisor to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I had created our first women's health fellowship in the United States and was brought to Washington to do that. But lo and behold, down the block was NASA. So I also became the senior medical advisor for NASA for over 18 years, took a stint in the White House working at the Office of Science and Technology Policy during the Obama-Biden years. And I also created a boutique consultancy called Solomed Solutions, which has allowed me to consult with scientific and agencies all across the globe, providing scientific and strategic direction. I'm very delighted to share with you a nonprofit that I created out of my time at the White House. It was a confluence of events during that time. We had just published um, our studies looking at how the body adapts in space through a sex gender lens. And we were dealing with Ebola and how protective equipment wasn't working. And I'll talk more about that tonight. But out of it came a nonprofit that I developed called iGiant. And if you're from the space world, you gotta have an acronym. And it stands for the Impact of Gender and Sex on Innovation Novel Technologies. We're the only nonprofit accelerator for gendered innovation across health, IT, transportation, retail sectors in the world. And space has been just a major component of it. We've had challenge competitions, we've had summits, we have many students around the globe that have a focus. I recently also joined a really exciting company called Star Harbor. And they are the first, will be the first publicly accessible R&D as well as spaceflight training facility in the world. 
So I would love for you to engage with me on so many different capacities, as you can see through Star Harbor, through the podcast, through iGiant, because you know we talk about opening space for all. Well, right now we have to ensure that there's space for all of us on this planet. And as we work together, we're then going to democratize space for everyone. And I look forward to the night to talk about some of the medical issues, to talk about some of the technologies that we can innovate to allow all of us to be up there. So thank you so much for letting me have a few minutes of your time. Thank you so much, Sarah Lynn. I told you the entire panel was incredibly accomplished and such a leader. Everyone is such a leader in this area. Um, it's such an honor to see a group of people who are working towards the the future of humans in space from so many different angles. And so I think from medicine to music, um, honestly, there's so many different areas. And we, we go across to law as well, because, of course, law follows human beings to every part of the globe that they go to. And it's so important to... Um, I guess, you know, law helps us work with each other. It helps us resolve conflict when we have conflict. And of course, right now, even though there's no real, you know, there's no big wars in space yet, as soon as humans start going to space and start colonizing areas on the moon and Mars, what's going to happen? There's going to be conflicts. And so legal skills, both the skills that we have here on Earth for contract management, as well as all of the other areas that relate to aerospace law are so important. And of course, I'm biased because I happen to be a lawyer and a scientist. So I'm completely biased in this area. I can't help it. I'm really sorry. My area of law, I do compliance for experiments to the International Space Station. So that's that's where I'm coming from. But I'd really like to introduce the next panellist, Miss Alison uh, Decker. And I'm sure she's going to enlighten you a little more about legal matters and her um, perspective uh, in humans in space. Well, hi everyone. Um, I'm Allison Claire Decker of Allison Claire Law. It's a Southern California law firm that works a lot with aerospace companies and SaaS companies and tech companies. And I'm also a legal advisor to Just Add Astra, which is an international organization focused on bringing human rights to the stars. So. As you might guess, I come to today's topic with an attorney's perspective, and a lot of my work focuses on legal space issues, including jurisdiction, employment relationships, and creating a space legacy for future generations. I think a lot of people, especially those who aren't really plugged into the space industry, don't realize how close we are to having a large number of private citizens living and working in space. So what once seemed to be sort of mere science fiction, it's just around the corner. But our international space laws are not really ready for this. They were drafted back in the 1960s and intentionally focused on keeping space solely for national governments. These international treaties do not provide much guidance, if any, for the commercialized private space exploration efforts that we are currently seeing, which means we have a unique opportunity right now to shape the future for humans in space for generations to come. On the labor side of things, you know, think about it. Will we see Elon Musk's indentured servant program on Mars come to pass? Or maybe it'll be more like the Doctor Who episode where an employer chooses profits over lives and stops providing expensive oxygen to its employees. Or will conditions be so intolerable that we see the birth of a group of radical terrorists like the OPA of the Expanse? Or maybe we build the socialist utopia of Star Trek. But whatever happens right now, it is completely unclear what laws apply to private citizens working in space, what rights they have, or how they can enforce them. So we do need to come up with new rules and regulations to govern the living and working conditions of private citizens in space, including minimum environmental and atmospheric 
have a habitability requirements, guaranteed access to oxygen, food, and water. Remember, you're going to be relying on your employer for this. Uh, protection from radiation and new guidelines as to what constitutes a workday and work week. Since the farther we move away from Earth, the less we will be tied to a 24 hour day and a 365 day year. And we need to do this now, not before new potentially abusive norms are established. And none of this will mean anything unless there's a way to enforce these rights. And we currently do not have a system in place that allows for access to justice while in space. We kind of make everyone come back to Earth for these things, which will not be practicable when we're out on Mars. Um, on the human legacy side of things, we need to think about what aspects of space we want to preserve for future generations. Space has been a valuable asset and a part of humanity's cultural heritage for longer than we have recorded history. And space is an international commons in much the same way that the high seas are on Earth. And like our terrestrial commons, we are already dealing with pollution in space. For example, our lower Earth orbit has become overcrowded despite the relatively short period of time that we've been able to successfully launch objects into orbit. Right now, Orbiting Earth, there are approximately 5,000 active satellites, and this number is expected to more than quadruple by the end of the decade. And then there is the trackable orbital debris, of which there are approximately 30,000 pieces. On top of that, there are an estimated hundreds of millions of pieces of untrackable orbital debris, ranging in size from a marble to a paint fleck. And all of these types of debris, the small, the large ones, they can cause significant damage to satellites um, and human space missions. Yet, currently there are really no international rules or enforcement mechanisms to curb space pollution, to limit the overproliferation of satellites, or to ban destructive and dangerous ASAT testing. So, and I know there have been, there's been sort of individual groups and different, different communities and different governments that have come together to try to make rules, but there isn't sort of an overarching rule that we are following in the international law on this topic. Instead, we're, we're really relying on nations to govern their own private actors and to govern themselves without disincentivizing a sort of first come, first claim space exploration system. So ask yourself, what will our space legacy be? Will it be a strip mined moon or a Martian landscape free from any human debris? Will our space legacy be an unusable lower Earth orbit or will the Milky Way still be visible from Earth in some places? And I think the solution to both these labor and legacy issues is to create regional space governance organizations because we need to be thinking in new ways about how we govern space as we become a truly multi-planetary species. And I look forward to, to chatting about all these topics with everybody from all these different backgrounds, because I think we all need to work together. You know, it can't just be boring law. It can't just be science. We have to, we have to combine everything together to really figure out what's going to work for us in space. Thank you so much, Alison. That was, you raised so many really important issues. And you really touched also on the issue of intergenerational equity. And I think that one of the things that we should probably discuss once everyone's introduced themselves is this concept of, you know, what can we do to ensure that space is a diverse, equitable and inclusive space for all? And Alison, that was your question, I think. Tell me if I get it wrong, but I'm pretty sure... That was your question. And yes, I think that, that is one know, of my questions. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so the idea of intergenerational equity to make sure that we don't pollute the environment in a way that means that future generations can't access resources, can't travel into space and can't do the things that we can freely do now before we've messed it up for the, the next few generations. It's also an important idea to make sure that as we move into the future, we're thinking about our children and our grandchildren and, and all the generations to come. So thank you so much, Alison. So our next uh, panelist is Miles Harris, and he is currently in London, right, Miles? And it's dark o'clock. So thank you so much for joining us. I meant to say thank you for joining us to everyone else, but it, it's especially I know what it's like at dark o'clock, so we are so grateful you could join us, Miles, and I'd love it if you could share your perspective 
on uh, humans in space and, and your work. Well, thank you very much, Kim. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. It is quite late here in London, but um, it's been amazing so far listening to all the other speakers. So thank you very much for, for letting me be here. Um, so my name is Miles Harris. I'm, uh, I'm a nurse by background. Um, and I'm just coming towards the end of a of PhD at University College London in risk and disaster reduction. Um, and in my research, what I look at is healthcare in very remote environments and how we can mitigate risks to health in those places. Um, and one of those environments that I closely look at is obviously in space, space arguably being one of the remotest environments. Um, and this led me in, in my research to put together a research group at UCL called the UCL Space Health Risks Research Group. And we're a multidisciplinary community of researchers and practitioners who have come together to investigate health in space in order to benefit life back on Earth. We have a variety of different projects, but our flagship project was an analog mission, which we did back in May 2022. Um, this analog mission was a, a simulation of the human exploration of another planet. And the way that we did this was we went to a remote and uninhabited island on the west coast of Scotland. And this island served as our analogy of outer space. The, our analog astronauts, who are our research participants, uh, we kept the location of the analog top secret for months, so they didn't know where they were going. All we said was they need to go to a small town on the west coast of Scotland called Oban by five o'clock on a Friday, and we would do the rest. And that would allow us to bring the analog astronauts to the island, and when they stepped off the rocket, the powerboat, um, they stepped onto the island, this other planet, and they saw it for the first time, much like when an astronaut opens the rocket door, they see the planet for the first time. So if anybody's been to Scotland before, you'll um, probably realise that uh, it doesn't look like space. It's certainly not very red. It's usually covered with a lot of heather and it's very green because of all the rain. Um, so, But we weren't actually interested in making it look like another planet. We wanted to make it feel like another planet. And by keeping the island's location secret, that was one way of doing that. But we did a number of other things as well to increase what we call the, the fidelity, the realism of the simulation. The analog astronauts were a variety of different healthcare practitioners. We had doctors, we had paramedics, and we also had um, non-registered healthcare practitioners as well, first aiders. And when they were brought to the island, they were given a bag of medical equipment and they were told, if you ever need to use any of this equipment, you can't be resupplied because you're on another planet and it would take far too long to get this equipment to you. And we also manually delayed communication as well, so they couldn't reach out to an experienced practitioner and get some live, um, a live advice. Um, so they were completely on their own. And this was another example of how we simulated the human exploration of another planet. So during the mission, the analog astronauts had an aim. And the aim was separated into two parts. They had to survey this planet to identify areas of geological interest and also potential landing sites. And fortunately, one of the analog astronauts uh, was a planetary scientist who currently works for the Chinese Space Agency, but previously worked for NASA um, and was part of the team that selected the, the Mars Perseverance rover. So we had a subject matter expert in, in this field. And we told the analog astronauts that as you're exploring this island, this planet, um, we're going to enact realistic healthcare scenarios that could happen during the exploration of another planet. And these scenarios were designed on our symposium, which we had won some funding for the year before. And these scenarios were designed purposefully not to just have physical health problems, but also psychosocial and mental health and well-being problems as well. So as the analog astronauts were exploring the islands, they, the, the planet, they came across these scenarios. Um, and what we did as well was this, these scenarios weren't just for 40 minutes to an hour, which is what normal clinical simulation lasts for. These lasted for eight hours each, which really stretched the, the analog astronauts because they weren't used to providing healthcare in a pre-hospital environment that they hadn't been to before with limited resources. Um, and that really allowed us to conduct a huge amount of research during this analog mission. We did everything from testing some newly re developed remote health monitoring technology, 
um, to looking at astropharmacy, medicines in space, and then also use medical anthropology to explore what constitutes normal health on another planet and how that relates to life back on Earth. So this project was a pilot. It was the first of its kind in the UK. Um, that research is now complete and we're writing up the papers for publication. And the evaluations were extraordinarily positive. So um, the steering group, which Verena was a member of, and, and many thanks to her for her advice. Um, we, we conducted the evaluation and, and we decided that, yes, we want to do this again and we want to do more research with more people. So I founded an organization called Space Health Research. Um, and this is an organization that specializes in analog missions, continuing the research that we did through the research group um, and doing more analog missions like this and different kinds as well in the UK. Um, so our aim is to, to expand the accessibility in space and explore all of these problems um, in order to benefit life back on Earth. So I think that's my six minutes up and thank you very much for listening. You're yeah, yeah, bang on time. That was amazing, Miles. Um, I think that's incredible looking at, you know, healthcare in remote environments is, is such an incredible area and something that is totally applicable to what we do here on Earth as well. There are so many different remote environments on Earth where the research that you're undertaking could be utilised to help people here also. So that is absolutely incredible. And uh, you're right. What are you going to do on Mars if you fall down, break a leg and need some sort of specialist surgery? There are so many different scenarios that even happen here on Earth where we have people even, you know, sort of close to emergencies like that. So this is such important work that you're undertaking and you know I congratulate you in fact everybody is undertaking some very important work because the human future in space is going to depend on the work that people are doing now um, for the future so thank you so much Miles I think I'd like to introduce our next panelist um, who is Ms Gatika Gorthy and um, she'll introduce herself and tell you about her work and, and what she's doing right now. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, you know, it was wonderful hearing all of the other panelists and I'm so excited to speak along all of you today about my own interests in space medicine. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Gitika Gorthy and I'm the founder and CEO of Ignited Thinkers, a nonprofit organization I founded in the eighth grade to spread space education to all students. And I'm also a freshman at Columbia University in the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences as a C. Prescott Davis Scholar, aspiring to be an aerospace physician, medical researcher, and astronaut. So a little bit of a backstory. Um, I founded Ignited Thinkers, as I mentioned, in middle school, and, and it all started off with a conversation I was having with my parents. Um, both of them are immigrants from India, and so growing up for me, I honestly had no clue that I could become an astronaut for real, and I could be a part of the space industry, um, and I got to grow up with my interest in biology, and I was curious about the human body, and space was kind of just never in my mind. Um, but when I got into middle school, I joined a rocketry club because of my tech ed teacher. So I took an engineering and design class in seventh grade. And my teacher noticed how I was really fascinated with the rocketry unit. So he was like, Gitika, why don't you join my after school rocketry club? And I was like, OK, I don't know if I can do this, but I'll try. And I ended up falling in love with building and constructing model rockets. And um, in eighth grade, I started constructing my own. So instead of using the kits that were already pre-made and me just kind of gluing it together and flying at the back of my school, I started actually building my own fins, designing them on CAD, laser printing them, and got really excited with how we could manipulate model rockets. And I built the biggest one I had so far, and I dragged my parents along to a launch site that because my rocket couldn't be launched at the back of my school because it was very large and so my parents had to drive me like 30 minutes out to like a big field and on the car ride back home my parents were just amazed with how my rocket flew they have never actually seen a rocket fly before let alone a rocket that i built um and so they were you know they said something that really just changed my life 
Um, specifically, my dad, who was on the car ride back home, he said, Gitika, you're so lucky to have the opportunity to build and fly a rocket at the age of 13. I've never seen a real or a model rocket fly till now, and that's because of my daughter. So you're very lucky to have this opportunity in middle school. And then it just all clicked to me that I am very lucky. I took it for granted how I have a rocketry club in my middle school. And so then I was like, you know, the inner Girl Scout in me came out and I knew that I was going to do something about this. And I was going to create this middle school rocketry club experience. I was very fortunate to have to every student across the world. So through Ignited Thinkers, we have free workshops, webinars. We have a YouTube channel where we highlight diverse space champions and their very unique stories into the industry really just to show that space is for all. Um, and also we are hosting space contests around the world with our first one being in Zimbabwe next summer. Um, so we're really excited to just continue the outreaching to different communities and show students that there's no one path into the industry, but really anyone can be a part of space. Um, and more of my personal educational background, as I mentioned, I'm currently a freshman at college. And so I've been recently getting involved in research um, last summer, I was an intern at NASA Ames Research Center, where I did a lot of work with genomics and data analysis to understand how in the micro scale, how are these tiny fruit flies that are sent to space differing um, in space compared to ground control, and how can that tell us about humans? And at first it can sound confusing. How can we learn about humans from tiny, tiny bugs? Um, I was pretty shocked too, um, but you can see that there's so much, you know, especially in the cardiovascular diseases, there's a lot of similarities between um, fruit flies and humans. And so by understanding fruit flies genes and how they behave in space, we can potentially understand a lot about astronauts and humans in space. And so I did a little bit of that research um, and I knew that this was my future, especially after that internship, space biology just greatly excited me even more. Um, I started re reading papers and getting involved with more research experiences. I worked with Baylor College of Medicine, Space Medicine Center, University of Central Florida. And now um, I recently got involved with Columbia's Medical Center. They have a research lab called the Coo Lab that I joined and they do ataxia and tremor research, which I've been slowly trying to integrate with space as well. So really just trying to combine both of my passions for medicine and space together to develop technology to understand like I, my future goal really is to develop technology that can be used in space and bring that back down to earth to make healthcare more accessible for everyone so really i think i can relate with both um sarah and miles when they talk about space medicine but i'm also really excited to hear more about adrian and the listens a list um a listen uh, more background in law and music um, and how it kind of intertwines to make humans uh, be able to travel further into space and to improve life on Earth. So thank you. And I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much, Gitika. I, I absolutely believe you will develop that technology for space in the future. I know that, you know, that's really the driving force behind what everyone does is having that belief in themselves and that real interest and passion for space and what they do. And you've seen here across all of the different disciplines uh, related to humans in space, each one of these panellists have a unique viewpoint and are undertaking some unique uh, research and business and, and really helping to improve the space ecosystem as we move forward. So I think, thank you everybody for your point of view. And we've got about 20 minutes left. So I thought maybe what we might do is pose a couple of questions for the panelists. And uh, we have a couple of questions of our own. I think, you know, that question of what can we do to ensure that space is a diverse, equitable and inclusive space for all. We kind of like everybody really touched on that in in a small part. And so I would welcome any thoughts from the panel on that particular question. And if anyone in the audience has a question that they would like to ask the panel, please type it in the chat box. And um, if we can go, through, you know, if we can get to them all, that would be that would be really great. So I don't know who wants to start. Just go ahead and and uh, and unmute if you have something. Um, Kim, 
for you for the question. And I just have to say I'm in awe of all my panelists. It's truly, <laughs> I would go to space with all of you and immediately. <laughs> So I knew I'd be entertained. I'd have my rights protected and I would have people watch <laughs> to make sure I survived it. Um, you know, when we think about inclusion, diversity, equity, I sometimes use analogies. And, and one of them that I think we could use for the space program is inclusion would be that you're actually invited to participate, to go into space. Um, diversity would be maybe you're asked to do a spacewalk, but where there would be equity is when you're actually given a spacesuit that fits you so you can do the walk. <laughs> And it's really, it's, I know we've talked a few years ago about the whole issues of spacesuits, and, and I really think it translated down to, are we looking at the universe through this sex gender lens? I had the privilege to testify in front of the National Space Council, the White House National Space Council in August 2019. And at the time, Vice President Pence actually asked me about this. And so it crosses political lines, it crosses social demographic lines, it's really a human rights issue. Um, and I, I just want to say that I look at, again, the world of acronyms, and if you're not given the resources, opportunities, and tools, ROT, your career is going to rot on the vine. And so it really behooves all of us from the beginning to, to think about that. And I think we're all starting to do that from our own particular angle and our own particular lens to make sure that we're given the resources, that opportunities are open up wide and that we're also given the tools to do our jobs well and safely. And once we do that, we can truly democratize space. Well, thank you, Sarah Lynn. I think that the word democratization of space, you know, we've moved away from governments, you know, Alison touched on the International Space Treaty was written in the 1950s, you know, at, sorry, 1967. Uh, and it really talked about how uh, space agencies would do things in space. It didn't make much accommodation for private companies and, at all. And so now we see the development of public-private partnerships between space agencies and commercial entities. And we've seen the miniaturization of technology. We've seen reusable technologies being developed. And so I think that all of this is feeding into that idea that space is for everyone. So I wonder if any of the other panelists have any thoughts about uh, diversity and equity in space. And so Firstly, I mean, I agree with everything that, that Sarah said and what you just followed up with, Kim. And one thing that I was thinking as well, and this was to do with our analog mission that we did earlier in the year, was um, how do we communicate this with um, with people? Because it, it is a, a human rights issue and, and space is for everybody. And one thing that we did as a steering group was we, we not only wanted to do excellent science and, and really engaging research that had a meaningful and tangible impact for life back on Earth, but we wanted to synthesize that with the arts as a way of communicating that. So we applied for funding to, to, um, to have a, an artist in residence um, who came on our mission to purely be an artist and to do whatever art they thought was relevant. Um, so our artist was Dr. Sarah Fortis. Um, she's a, a performing artist and, and a sculpture really by background. Um, and she did some sculptures, like some live castings of hand positions, like taking a, a radial pulse. Um, and she mixed the, the sculptures up with some samples, uh, soil samples from the island or this planet. So it was actually the sculptures that she made as a, as a, as a sculpturist um, were actually made from, from the island itself. Um, and, you know, I was thinking when Adrian was talking about her music, um, you know, that is a language that everybody speaks and everyone, um, um, you know, everyone can engage with. Um, and for anyone, anyone that doesn't, it's finding another communication tool. So I was thinking then about uh, Katika's work um, as an educator. Um, uh, so I think really the arts is a way of, of transcending all of that and demonstrating that space is, is for everybody and everyone can benefit from it. That's really great. I'm, I'd invite, uh, so Alison, do you have a, something yeah, to I, add? I think I think one of the things that that both um, Dr. Dr. Mark and and uh, Miles have, have pointed out is that we have to be very intentional in inviting people into space. Um, so often, I think 
we still default to these concepts of like what an astronaut looks like or what a space program looks like or who do we want on our crew? And we default to these stereotypes from the 1960s and the 70s where there was really only one type of person and we didn't think outside of that box. And you still see this a little bit when we look at the restrictions that you have for astronauts in general. And they're, they're a little bit looser, definitely in private companies. They have been pushing sort of boundaries, making more diverse crews. But, you know, we are still only, you know, a lot of the space agencies are still only recruiting certain types of people. They're not recruiting people who might have disabilities, which is probably less of an issue in space than it might be here. Um, they're not looking necessarily to to find people from outside communities or different areas of the world that don't have their own space programs and inviting them to be part of, of their space programs or of their national space programs. So I think we have to be really intentional in how we go out and look for people and think again about what everybody brings to the table. We know in, in businesses that a more diverse business that has people from outside perspectives, from different backgrounds, from different cultures, they do better overall as a business in the long term, like they're just more productive. And I think if we take that sort of idea of what works well and bring that together, if we make a crew that's really truly international and, and representative of all of humanity, I think that's going to do better in the long run than if we just go with sort of like, okay, we want to do that like white male alpha group from the 1960s again, because that worked well maybe it won't work as well, or maybe it's not the ideal solution. So really thinking outside of that box and inviting people into that space so that it's not just like, oh, well, we we threw out a net, no one applied. No, we have to go out and, and really bring those people in. That's a great point. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was just gonna say great point. Adrian, Adrian what would you like to add? Yeah, I, I just want to dovetail on what Allison said about intentionality, because if you look at NASA history and then NASA current programs, you see changes. There are also changes in national legislation that opened up more opportunities and NASA implemented that as well. So there's there's a lot of good history that's been written about that change in getting women involved in the program and getting African-Americans involved in the program and, and making it a more diverse community of, of astronauts and not just astronauts because there are many more people on the ground involved. Um, the Artemis program has the line, first woman, first person of color. Those are not just words being spoken by NASA. Those are words with action behind them. So I, I think that's very important. And then to that idea of accessibility, uh, I know ESA had a call for astronauts with certain disabilities to apply to be part of their programs. And there's a non-for-profit, it's not part of NASA, but there have been some former, at least one former NASA astronaut that was involved, it's called Mission Astro Access. And I think one of the participants actually was part of this conference. Uh, he's going to fly uh, on a mission coming up in December. Uh, they've already had at least one mission where people with disabilities have the opportunity to fly on the zero G parabolic flights and do research. So if someone is blind or someone is hearing impaired, they're doing research while they're on the flight to help to understand what would make it accessible for someone with their particular challenges to be effective on further space missions. So I think that intentionality and others have, have spoken to that idea as well, I think is all part of it. That they're all wonderful points. Gatika, do you have uh, something to add? Yes, yeah, those are all incredible points. And just to kind of build up what's already been said, I think that first reaching out to unique audiences is critical. Um, I think a lot of times and through untraditional means, I think in the space industry, we all understand space is important. And this is why we need to invest in the industry. And this is why NASA is given a billion dollar budget, but the regular you know, public who is not involved in space doesn't necessarily know or understand or take the time to get to know um, why space is really important, even though all these tools and all these podcasts and resources are out there. And I think it's because space is like a little bubble. So we just kind of are like echoing back and forth 
forth to each other by space is important, but it's not reaching the people and the common public. And so I think we need to start taking more action, investing, going on traditional paths. So like through music, as um, you know, Adrian was saying, through movies, talking with untraditional ambassadors, not just astronauts, but also, you know, performing artists and trying to get um, people who are not involved in the space industry to understand and communicate it to people who may listen to them. Because I think it's very difficult just in the space industry to try reaching out and saying why space is important and why we need to invest. And also another point is we kept mentioning how space has, you know, historically been very undiverse. And that's why I'm really glad for commercialization in space. I know there's a lot of, you know, is it good or are we, is commercialization even the right path that we're going in? But, you know, in terms of diversity, I believe that commercialization is really starting to break those glass ceilings. Um, most recently in Blue Origin, one of my really close friends, Sarah Sabri, she went and became an astronaut. She's the first Egyptian woman to fly to space. And I think seeing individuals like her who wouldn't necessarily get that opportunity through government agencies like NASA to be able to go to space. And now she's inspiring, giving inspiring talks all across Africa. It just is like a testament to how diversity is starting to grow in space and commercialization is really propelling that. And I think the last point I really wanted to make in terms of increasing inclusivity in space is age. A lot of times we talk about socioeconomic status, ethnicity, geographic location, or educational backgrounds, but not age. Um, I think every time I've been to a conference, usually it's on the older side, which is not to blame at all. But I think we also need to make a conscious effort to start involving younger students because they are the next generation who will be honestly leading all of these visions and goals we're talking about and making them a reality. And so really, I mean, I was listening to a conference um, and Blue Origin was saying they have around 20,000, maybe it was 200, not 20,000. It was like 200 open engineering jobs. And it was just crazy to me that in this market, there are so many engineering jobs open and no one's filling them up. So I think we need to really make a conscious effort to kind of get this next generation pipeline into the industry and continuously make an effort to include them in the conferences for free, because a lot of students won't make the effort if they have to pay money, raise awareness, um, or like find out how to earn money to be able to go to a, attend a conference that costs $500. So I think virtual conferences like these, as well as making student conferences free, um, is, is critical to increasing inclusivity in space. Those are all fantastic points. Thank you so much for sharing that point of view, especially your point about, you know, communicating space to everybody out there in the general public. Uh, I mean, we're all living in a space age. It's just that all of us who are passionate about space actually realise how much we all rely on space every day for everything that we do. And so it's so critical to be able to communicate that. So I think. We only have about eight minutes left. So I think what we might do is to um, go through each one of the panellists and get you to give uh, your final thought on humans in space. I think that um, it would be great to hear everyone's point of view on that. So I think we'll start this time from uh, Miles, if, if that's okay. Of course. I mean, my final thoughts are, you know, what a privilege to be part of this panel, to have such a diverse, um, passionate and talented group of people that are doing amazing work. You know, thank you so much for, for sharing this panel with you. Um, and, you know, to, to summarise, I would say that, you know, th there needs to be more events like this where we can come together and explore some of these issues and benefits of space explorations, um, particularly humans in space. Um, and particularly for how that can benefit life back on Earth. That's really key for me. And I think that's been a common thread throughout the whole the whole panel. So thank you very much once again. Thanks so much, Miles. Adrienne, would you like to uh, contribute next? Sure, I, I will repeat what Miles said. This is really an amazing group of people. I'm so glad I'm getting to hear what everybody's working on. I think there's a bright future for, for human space exploration. And that's also the, all the robotic missions. So we don't have people in helicopters yet on Mars, but we have people in helicopters virtually because of all the ones that created the Ingenuity mission. 
Um, I'll also say that I think there, there's much more of a role for uh, sort of different kinds of ambassadors like uh, the actress Nichelle Nichols from Star Trek. She was recruited by NASA to help recruit people into NASA. And so we have new generations of people, as Gitika says, that to get students going on one week or two week or three week missions or semesters in space, that would be really a wonderful idea to, to get more people involved. And I, I bet she could start it and run it too. So I'll just toss that out as an idea. I think we have a great future in space and definitely have the art and all these disciplines involved. Thank you so much, Adrian. That's, I mean, it's just fantastic. All of the uh, things that are happening around the world to try and get more people from more disciplines involved in space, because of course we all know the idea that the more diversity we have in any program, the better outcomes that we receive. So I wonder, um, if Alison, you might share your point of view. So I'm I'm just so excited to see the progress that we've been making in space and sort of like our return to space. Um, I the the increase that we are seeing in space activity is just exceptional in the past few years. We went from maybe having a launch maybe a couple times a year to we're seeing launches pretty much every week now. And I'm very excited to see a lot of the space agencies and the private companies sort of thinking in space in, in new ways. Um, there's a project actually that's going to be launched um, on Artemis, which will hopefully hopefully launch next week. <laughs> Artemis One, uh, organized by um, the German Space uh, Agency to test uh, new radiation vests based on women versus basing it on sort of male models. Um, and I think it's a great step forward that we're thinking about, like, how are we designing space for the future to make it so that everyone can be part of it? And I'm just really excited to see these new steps forward. And I hope we keep progressing. I hope we progress to making things better and not just going like, let's repeat what we did before, but really trying new things. And, and I think when we do that, we are going to see in, in my lifetime, people living on, on Mars. And that's just so exciting to me. I couldn't unmute for a second, apologies. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alison. Um, if in the last three minutes that we have, if Gitika and uh, Dr. S Dr. Mark could uh, make their comments. Yeah, so I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak on this wonderful panel. And my words are you know, kind of echoing what everyone else has already said, which is I am excited for the future of space. I believe it's the next place that we need to continue exploring. It's a new environment that will enable us to really just push our limits. Historically, space has enabled us to push our technological limits, like from developing the technology we can use today, like GPS, solar panels. Um, you know, navigating systems to be able to understand our own planet and to understand the effects of climate change. I think all of that has really come from space exploration and will continue to, you know, solve challenging problems and challenging questions through the space industry, which will ultimately allow us to develop new technology that will always come back down to benefit humanity. And I really just want to make it that everyone who's listening knows that everything that we're investing into space really is to help everybody on Earth, and I think that space is really just that next place we need to continue tackling um, for the betterment of society. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel and for all of you spending some time with us. I know we wish we probably had two or three more hours to really take the deeper dive. Space medicine to me is so fascinating. It's something that is a passion. Every single system of the body adapts. And what's remarkable is that we're developing countermeasures to try to help the body adapt to microenvironments, as well as procedures to help people adapt when they come back to earth. And there's so much application for how we need to leave, live our lives on earth. So I do see that synergy. And there's also the tech transfer aspect of it. So as we develop new technologies to allow us to live among 
on the stars. We can improve our life here on Earth as well. I just want to say that we talk about sex gender issues, and I really want us to take a non-binary approach. I want us to look at our lives through an intersectionality lens. It has been mentioned about age, but every aspect is what makes us what we are and who we are. And I hope space will ensure that we continue to do that. We do need to provide the tools. We do need to provide the resources. And certainly we need to provide the opportunities. And I think conferences and panels like this will certainly help us and lead us in the right direction. And I look forward to having a panel with all of you when we're on the moon together. Thank you so much. Dr. Mark, and, and thank you so much, everybody, for sharing your views and sharing your work. It's just incredible. I think that every single one of you on the panel and those people in the audience who are passionate about this topic, you are going to be the people who develop the programs that mean that humans can live and work in space independently from the earth. So I'd like to Thank everyone for attending. Thank all the panelists and hand back over to Rowena. Thank you very much, Kim. I'd like to say a huge thank you to you and to all our panelists today. It's been really fantastic to have you all with us and to listen to the, the wonderful and inspiring discussion that, that we've had. And I think each and every one of you shows that we can all play a role and we can all aspire to, to be part of space and the future of humans in space. And I think that not only the people who are here today, but the people who are able to listen to the recording will get an enormous amount out of this. And also just prompting people to think about these kind of issues is really, really important. And I completely endorse what Sarah just, just said about the sort of approach that we, we should be taking. That's, that's very much how I feel about it too. And I think the more that we can communicate that, that message, hopefully, the more we'll get it out there and the more it will actually start happening. So thank you all, all again. So I'll just give you a very quiet clap on, <laughs> on behalf of us all. Um, and we hope that you'll join us again another time but very very grateful and thank you especially to Miles for staying up so late that was a really big sacrifice on your behalf but uh, we're, we're very grateful so thanks again everyone thank you thank you thank, thank you